Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and today I'm absolutely delighted to have as my guest, Dr. Lisa Kemmerer. Uh, Lisa is uh, really internationally known for her work in animal ethics and social justice activism. She's been a teacher at major universities. Her PhD is in uh, philosophy and with research in animal ethics. She's written um, hundreds of hundreds of articles, 10 books, including uh, Eating Earth, uh, In Search of Consistency, Animals in uh, World Religions, Animals in the Environment. Uh, and um, she is the founder and is now really devoting, I think, most of her time to her vegan educational organization, Tapestry, which is really working to deal with social justice issues. So welcome, Lisa. I'm so excited to meet you. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. I'm excited to be here and thank you so much. Wow, you did a great job with that. I'm, I'm glad you did it, not me. <laughs> I know, you almost get to that point where you feel like you wanna meet that person, right? And it's you, yes. <laughs> and anyway, so I, you know, when I, when I went over your story, which is such an amazing story because you've really taken the steps of doing so many different things in your interest in the world and understanding, you know, indigenous and rural peoples and the roles of, you know, the, 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 the ways that, you know, we can be more, treat things more ethically in terms of people, animals and the like. So what I would like to know before we go on into some other depth, what were some of the early influences and talk a little bit about your early life that kind of put you on the path that you eventually followed your interest in comparative religions, your interest in animal mm. ethics and anim mm. so let's talk a little bit about that so people get a little idea of where you're coming from. Well, Tom Reagan said that there's three types of vegans and one of them is that you're just born that way. And I was just born that way. I was born with an interest in religions and I was born with a sense of compassion and a concern for suffering. It was just in me from my youngest days. And that was fostered by my father and my mother and my sister um, in my family. Uh, and of course, my sister who shares that and uh, is a very different person than I am, but, but really connects in a different way than I did. So she would join organizations very early on. And she was members in, in 1975 or 73, she joined her first organization. So I was getting input from her uh, new information. And, and, and that was very helpful in, in changing how I lived and shaping what I would do with that compassion that was in Where, where was that childhood? Where, where did you grow up? Where were you? Uh, Conway, Washington, okay. very rural, small town. We, I grew up on a little plot of land with chickens and ducks and ponies. And, you know, my parents took in strays. We had lots of dogs, lots of cats in particular, but dogs as well. Yeah, I understand that. You know, and I was, uh, I'm not married now, but I raised five children and we had 15 animals at the same time. So I lived on Noah's Ark for quite a it's, while. There, it's wonderful. Know? It's yeah, a great it way to grow up. Pretty amazing. Well, with that background early on, were you raised nutritionally as a vegan at that point or was that mm -hmm. not part of what happened at no, that point? No, no. Uh, but my mother was, she got us on the so-called health food diets of the day, um, which didn't taste good to any of us kids, but uh, you know, it was better for us. It was whole foods. And of course, having started my first years in white flour, it was a hard shift. Right. But, but so I had that in me that what you ate mattered. It was mattered to your life and your health. So with your, with your interest in, in, you know, animal rights and animal protection and compassion and so on, when did you personally make that kind of a shift in terms of your own eating habits and your own lifestyle? Was there a time in college or earlier than that or later than that? When did that actually happen for you? It was, a, uh, and I, I don't, I couldn't place it at a date. I could place it uh, our early 20s when my sister sent me a, a downed cow flyer from PETA. And I read it 
And I'm like, okay, time to start making some changes. And like most of us that made those changes early on, I mean, there wasn't vegan food. There, there, you couldn't, there weren't milks. There, the plant-based milks weren't out there. So when you made the shift, you basically gave things up. And I think too, it was a journey. It was something that you, you, you know, it took some time and you took steps along the way. And that was certainly true for me. I noticed that you, you know, you went through a master's program in theological studies and comparative religions at Harvard, and then you ended up going to the University of Glasgow in Scotland. How, you know, how did that all, how did that all transpire? How did that dance occur? That was later. And so I have a reading disability. So studies have always been a struggle for me. So I kept dropping out of school and I'd say, okay, I want to learn all sorts of things, but I'm not going to learn them this way. I think I'm going overseas. And I didn't know why I'd never been diagnosed. I just knew that that type of learning was a struggle for me and it didn't work very well. So I went overseas and started those travels. And my interest in religion was, I, I went places where I could study the religions I'd learned about in, in my youth and was fascinated by. Uh, and I would say that that disability was critical to shaping who I became and where I went. Well, your, your PhD was centered around research in animal ethics. Mm -hmm. So for our audience, can you just describe or just give a short definition of what that actually meant and what kind of research that, that was for you to do? What, what did you actually do in that regard? Boy, so I was actually working up in Alaska when I decided that that's what I was going to do. I had finished. So I, I, when I in my travels, I decided I wanted to get the degree in divinity and, and in comparative religions. And then, then I taught. And in teaching as an adjunct teacher, I realized, all right, this is what I want to do. This is how I can make the changes. This is, this is, what, this is what it's about for me. I got to go back to school. I thought, okay, how am I going to survive conventional education? I thought, okay, go on a trip. Let's, let's try uh, Glasgow. So I was accepted at Oxford and I thought, no, I think I want to go to Glasgow. I went up to, I wanted the green and the environment. So I would have worked at, with Lindsay, Andrew Lindsay in Oxford, but I chose to go to a place that was quieter and smaller. And uh, so then I had a chance to, ch to shape. You had two things you could do there and studying overseas was a fantastic experience. So I chose the one where I simply did research with the help of scholars. And I was able to focus on the work of Tom Reagan, the work of Peter Singer. And then I chose religions. So I looked at Lindsay's work. And then I also chose environment. I looked at a guy named Paul Taylor. So I started what, you know, in the end would be critical to who, to what my work became. I started kind of looking at those interconnections and how they were all important. All right, that's kind of an intriguing journey because I, I, I was so taken by the fact that you got up and did so many different things, went and fought fires in certain places. You really lived a very experiential mm -hmm. journey. Was a lot of that before that PhD work or some of that was after that? Because I know you traveled mm -hmm. from Asia to the Americas, all different parts of the world, living yes. in a wide variety of rural communities, you know, hidden monasteries, things all over the planet that were really fashioning how you looked at the world and how That's you were true. able to integrate yes. the idea of animal ethics mm -hmm. and even social justice systems, yes. which is really something that a lot of people mm -hmm. don't actually put together. They usually focus on one or the other. And I love the fact that you made such an effort to marry those things. So talk about, talk about that just a little bit, that marriage of that and your journey through those kinds of communities. And then I want to address a statement because I love the fact that it said that during those travels, it fashioned your understanding of, of time, necessities, and community. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to explain what that means because mm -hmm. it, it was an intriguing statement. And I said, you know, when I meet her, I got to ask her what she really meant by that. Okay, let's start with the first part of that question and how that all worked out. And, and I would say, as far as the outdoor things, I, my love of nature, again, that's kind of an innate trait. And and I would say I was born hyperactive and before they drugged people that were hyperactive. And so I just, I had tons of energy and my parents were wonderful. They just tried to channel it and uh, keep me out of trouble and alive and just let me rip. And they just put me into all sorts of different things. And so I had and I also grew up rurally, so I could have lots of time outdoors. Mm -hmm. And that was also very fundamental to my shaping, my interest in the environment now and the connection between animal agriculture and environment, my love of and connection with nature, which has always been a place I've turned to. Uh, <clears throat> every day, I have to have some time outside 
to feel, I don't want to miss a day, the day, the beauty of the outside world. And I still live in splendid isolation out, you know, I'm surrounded by green and trees and quiet and that suits my personality. So that's a fundamental part of who I am. It's just that love of nature and that connection. Um, and you also asked about um, the connections that I made. And, you know, I would say it, that wasn't something that I was perceptive about. I would say I was very slow to catch on. And I'm sure it's because I wasn't a reader, right? So I had to learn through experience. Right. So as I grew, and, and I would say I was, I was a first-rate, ignorant white person, um, privileged white person. But my travels really helped me later to put all that together. So I remember in India seeing poverty that, and in Bangladesh that, and in Nepal, the little kids running around on the ice in their bare feet. And they were happy. I would say they're happier than most of the people in my country. And I would say they were safer than most of the people in my country. Um, anywhere I went, people were safer generally than they are here because of we have such a fear of, of violence with guns and a, a theft, I think, because of that disparity between rich and poor. And, and that was not as true in other places uh, for whatever reason. But, and I remember seeing that poverty and I could always reflect back on that. What, what I, I remember seeing in the slums of Bangladesh, uh, yeah, that in particular, but in India as well, but just people uh, sitting in, in such hopeless conditions with children and, and nothing, you know, they had, they had nothing and they were hoping that someone would feed them for that day through begging and they would often harm a child and send them out to beg with a deformity in the hopes that someone would give them money because they had to eat. So seeing that kind of suffering and poverty, and of course it was years till I started to understand as I understand now that when we eat animal products, we are taking the food right out of the mouths of the hungry because it is so intensive, the grains that it uses, the, right. you know, the, how much of that we use for that. So those connections took a lot of time. Yeah, you know the idea that we're 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 feeding you know uh, eighty percent of the food that's grown on the planet mm -hmm. to animals that produce only fifteen percent of food for human consumption. The yes. the the entropy of that, the the yes. energy dissipation of that is just a loss. Unco it's unconscionable. I mean, it really it is. is. It's an it unconscionable is. situation. I'm here with Dr. Lisa Camero. We're going to take just a short break and hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the NHA Health Science Podcast. Dr. Frank Sabatino here. Are you ready for an extraordinary adventure that combines relaxation, exploration, and vibrant health? Then set your sails for the NHA plant exclusive cruises. Imagine cruising through exotic destinations, savoring delectable plant-based cuisine, and engaging in rejuvenating activities, all while surrounded by like-minded individuals passionate about health and wellness. These cruises offer more than just a vacation. They offer an opportunity to immerse yourself in the NHA's principles of healthy living. And they rank incredibly high on the ratings of eco-friendly cruise lines. We all know how important our oceans are, and our cruise partner, Windstar, is fully committed to this. Join us aboard our upcoming plant-exclusive cruises and experience the synergy of health and leisure. Delight in gourmet SOS-free meals prepared by talented chefs, attend informative workshops, and enjoy the serenity of the sea, all tailored to nourish your body, mind, and spirit. For more details and to reserve your spot on our next adventure, visit healthscience.org and click the link under travel. Don't miss this chance to indulge in a wellness retreat like no other. Elevate your well being and make memories that will last a lifetime. And remember, your feedback matters. Please take a moment to leave a rating and a review wherever you're listening to the NHA Health Science Podcast. I'm Dr. Frank Sabatino, your host. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I'm here with social activist and animal ethicist, uh, Dr. Lisa Kemmerer, and we're talking about 
her journey and, and, and her, what she has vision in terms of different cultures and their perspectives and, and how they, um, and this is kind of an important piece because I, I love the statement that you made and it said that when you're someone who wants to foster or, under, or really promote uh, more social justice, you have to get a deeper understanding of oppression. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know you wrote that statement mm. or that mm. quote in that um, in one of your books. So t talk about why that understanding becomes such a critical piece, that understanding and, and maybe a, a more up close and personal experience of oppression to really to really uh, hammer home the idea of social justice. As a vegan, I'm so aware that everyone's vegan for some reason, but very few people who are vegan understand how much good they're doing. So the book Amore that I wrote, where you have the, the five letters, A-M-O-R-E, that talk about the five reasons we should go vegan, and they're all interconnected. And for whatever reason you go vegan, you are doing all of these other things that right. are wonderful for the world. And of course, you know, my studies in ecofeminism have really helped me to start uh, to understand oppressions and how they're connected. And uh, I think that having a, a deeper understanding, you you referred to that comment I made about how my travels affected me. One of the key things I learned, and I took off traveling before I was even 18, I was very young. I was too young to be, I remember my father when I said, Dad, I'm going overseas. And he said, no, you're not. Within a year, I was I was often going and my mother just smiled. I think she, I have, I'm a, a child of my mother in that sense. But when I came back from that trip, what I realized was that anything I take for granted in my life is just a matter of how I grew up, place right. and time, which really freed me to start exploring other things and to have a more open mind and to start eventually to start looking at things like privilege, things like speciesism. Uh, understanding the environment and the importance to the connection of poverty and how it is that the marginalized people are peoples are the ones who end up working in those slaughterhouses, who end up dealing with those chemicals, with those monocultures. So starting to make those connections. So it does go all the way back, all as you say, all the way back to my childhood and who I was through my travels, which were inspired both by a, a reading disability and too much energy to sit around and sit around in classrooms. And that ability over time to, to drag myself back to the conventional classroom and do the reading I needed to do to start to keep connecting those dots and to bring those experiences overseas and in my heart through some of the theory and some of the understanding of scholars to do something larger with them. Hmm. Yeah, that's intriguing. I, there was another piece, and I, and I want to get into this discussion with you a little bit because it centers around the idea of personhood for animals, which is always kind of an intriguing piece for me. You know, in, in, in the United States, as you probably well know, there are a number of attorneys that have for decades been uh, in a surrogate manner advocating the habeas corpus rights for animals that are incarcerated. And it's kind of an interesting thing because the habeas corpus rights are really to uh, counter, you know, the negative aspect of confinement. So they're standing up for animals that are in that confinement. And I read that when you had spent time in sanctuaries, like in Cambodia with bears and elephants and so on, mm. it left you to ponder the moral conundrum of animals, even in sanctuary yeah. confinement. Talk a little bit about what that meant and what, what, what you were trying to convey with that statement. What's when you talked about in the exact phrase, pondering the moral boundaries of animal confinement. Uh, let's talk about that just a little bit, because then I want to understand how you envision the evolution of thingness and the selective way we establish personhood for animals that are up close and personal with us, but are disconnected from all the other creatures that are not, so that, yeah. we, so that we almost unconsciously play this role in decimating you know, the fact that since 1970 to now, 60% of all wild animals are gone. So, you know, how, let's talk a little bit about that, but talk to me about that statement, that, that, that idea of pondering the moral boundaries of animal confinement. What does that actually mean? Well, it means that whenever, whenever we do our best to try to help animals by putting them in, uh, in confinement, we are making a decision for their lives as to what is best. 
And I know as a human being that it varies from human to human what it is that we want for our lives. And I have no doubt with, I grant personhood, I don't grant it. Personhood is real, not right. just for human beings, but for uh, any number of species, you know, to have a personality is to be a person. And we're slowly, to me, we don't need to discover that a crab has a personality and it's different from the crab next to them. It's just clear to me, just as clear to me that it's true in humans, it's human, it's true for all these other species. Right. So for me, I just take that as a given, just as it's as a given that they're sentient. So um, that personhood is going to be different being to being. And I have no doubt there were some bears who would rather be alive and in confinement. I don't, ha I don't have no doubt. I don't know what it is to be a bear. I assume from my experience with human beings that there are some bears that are okay with living as they live rather than being dead. And I also assume that there are some bears who would rather not be alive than be held in confinement. And so that's the question of the moral boundaries is that we cannot know, we cannot know when we are trying to help other beings, whether we're doing them in the end a disservice or not. Right. And there is, there is often a selfishness in human beings when we are, for instance, trying to save species, say we'll save the wolves and when there get to be enough of them, we start trapping them. That is not okay by any stretch of the imagination that we keep these species on the planet so that we can ex cruelly exploit them. It's not okay. So again, the moral boundaries of where to some extent we would say, well, look, they're doing a good thing. They're putting the wolves back in the territory where they used to be. Well, it could be a good thing, but if we're going to, in the end, trap them and shoot them and try to control them according to what we think their numbers should be, Right. Never mind that we are the most overpopulated species on the planet. We are the ones who are empowered. We have the power to make these decisions. So it has another, the moral, the moral question is what we have the power to make decisions for other living beings. And we cannot know, we cannot always know what they would prefer. And we usually don't bother to wonder. Well, let me ask you a question because you had a pretty extensive experience in Africa, in Asia, and really spending time in a variety of sanctuaries and, and being involved with that. And I, I agree with you. I think the sentientness and the emotion that animals manifest shows their individuality, not just that just one lump species. Have you seen where when you, you, when you make a statement like some animals are okay with confinement and others probably are not because they would rather be in a different kind of an environment. In your experience, did you see those kinds of things manifest empirically? I mean, did you Absolutely. did you get a sense where you said, wow, this animal really does not dig yes. being confined yes. in this situation? So yes. you actually had that experience. Yes. That's that's amazing. Yes, that's yes. you can amazing. see the depression. You can see either in their behavior, a kind of a neurotic behavior or right. and you know, they, they try they try very hard to keep them happy and entertained, uh, but it's not their natural and, you know, they have to do things like maybe chain the elephants at some times. Um, it is, we are controlling them. And, and I will say again, I believe we're doing it in the end for our benefit. So we are keeping species alive because we want the species. And it is the individual morally that matters. And then if we would approach it that way, I think we'd take a very different look. And by the way, I use the term animal, and I know you know from the reading you've done, but I use the term animal for listeners out there. Um, it's, it's any animal other than myself. So animal is scientifically, human beings are included. So when I'm talking about any species other than the human being, I use animal to be scientifically correct and so that I don't have to be burdened with things like other than human animals. All right. Yeah, and that's that uh, that's understandable, and that's great. Um, where can people uh, just uh, at this little bit of a break? Where can people follow you and find you, Lisa? What's a good location for them to uh, to learn more about you and the work that you're doing with your organization? What's the what's a website or a place that they can go to? Tapestry, tapestryofpeace.org or .com uh, has 
Uh, you can, or you can also go to the name lisakemmer.com and you can find Tapestry through there and it has a list of publications and I try very hard to get all of my articles and chapters from books free and online in different places. So either on research.com or on my own website, there's many. I, it, the whole point of Tapestry is to make things free and accessible. So the book Amore, it's $10 online, but as soon as I gather the resources, that book is going to be put online for free as the Christianity book that I just wrote. And I'm no longer publishing with publishers so that I can do that. I can put yeah. them online for free. I understand that. And that's great. I, now you, you, you know, you wrote a book on uh, animals and world religions, which is kind of an intriguing title to me because um, it's very interesting that the foundation for most religions is based in compassion, love, those kinds of concepts. They're, they're kind of, you know, overwhelming or overriding concepts for many religious mentalities, regardless of where the religion is. But yet it's not extended oftentimes to the idea of animals and, and other creatures other than humans that are part of those religions. Mm -hmm. So what was the what was the gist of that story that you portrayed in that book? What were you trying to portray and what what was the thesis of that particular uh, of that particular work? The animals and world religions. That work started out as part of my work in, in Glasgow, in Scotland, and my doctoral work, and it was expanded into a, a, a book. And so my, my interest was in discovering what religions really had to say with my eyes. I wanted to really look at documents and really start to understand, because if you ask people, they won't know. Even if it's their religion, they won't know. And then if you ask them across a religion, they really won't know. So I just wanted to immerse myself in the beauty of these teachings and really see what they said. And, and so that's how I came to understand that, you know, Judaism and Christianity, you know, that God creates a vegan world and um, God really dislikes violence. And I went, the Indian traditions, understanding, understanding that compassion is at the core of every religious tradition. God right. is love, ahimsa. And then the beauty of those Eastern traditions, uh, the, the interconnections through reincarnation and karma. So just having these, these different ways of understanding our connection to animals and the larger world. And there's in that book, there's always a first part is on nature, and then it goes on specifically to focus on animals. So again, getting that, that, that it's all connected, that nature is habitat. Nature's where animals live. If you don't protect the natural world, you're not protecting animals. So doing one without the other won't work. So going systematically, and it is still the only book out there that systematically goes through the major religions plus indigenous traditions and explores that topic. There's no other book that tries it. And I know why. It took me 15 years to complete that book. And it's just a tremendous amount of, of work to, to do all that. You have right. to be young and foolish to even start such a project. So let, let's take it a step further. So then let's talk a little bit about um, your organization. Let's talk about Tapestry. And, and let's talk about what what is your goal? What is the purpose of the organization? What kind of work do you do through it? Talk a little bit about that so people understand that organization that you founded and how it's a, a platform for your social justice activism. Let's talk a little bit about that. Tapestry has, I'd say, a, a, a few things that are unique about it. One of them is that it focuses on the interconnections where animal ethics are concerned. Another is that one of its primary focuses is religion, which again, in our movement, religions have kind of been kicked to the curb. People are disillusioned with their religion because there's, you know, you, if you go to sermons, you're disappointed. They don't get it. The leaders don't get it. So most vegans have rejected their religious tradition, but obviously that's a mistake. There's, we need to stay in our religious traditions and, and have the knowledge to help people realize the changes they need to make. So that's one of the key things. And so Tapestry is working on a website. I guess the third thing I'd say about Tapestry is it's an educational it's, it is where I give back. So I was privileged to have all these experiences in an education and now putting all that together, I want to put as much as I can while in the years that I have left before I die, I want to get as much online as I can and do as much as I can to help, to help bring awareness. So that's the goal of it. That's the goal of tapestry and your work. Okay. And yeah, one I of the, let me just say one more thing. One of the things with religion that I'm working on now is a website that has everything from 
uh, the Animals and World Religion book. One of my goals is to is to complete all of the major religions and indigenous traditions so that anyone anywhere in the world can go and look up their religion and understand what common people don't seem to understand about their religion, the real teachings of what it says of how we ought to treat animals. So I have uh, Judaism up, Christianity's ready, but like the books, I, I still need to get the resources to put those online. But they'll eventually be there, free and open for anyone in the world to see. It's called animalsandreligion.org or .com. You know, some have argued, uh, even some of the philosophers like Krishnamurti and others have argued the point that when we establish these boundaries of religions and countries and lines of demarcation, mm -hmm. as much as they have their beautiful traditions, in a way they foster separateness and disconnection. And so how do you walk that fine line of having and really uh, respecting the differences of these different faiths and belief systems while at the same time trying to engender the idea that there is no separation between us and everything else that lives on this planet. So how do we dissolve the I and how do we dissolve those boundaries in the midst of supporting and respecting things that are actually separate in certain ways that they function? I think yeah. that's a really big question because it, it, it the, the, as you point out, the idea of connection and connectiveness is really the solution to such social injustice that exists and even uh, ethical you know, disparities with animals. How do we engender that connection in the face of separateness? For me, I do it by working inside the religious traditions and I do it so that I'm not telling, I'm not, I try never to come from the perspective of my own background, but to really study the texts and understand that tradition that I'm working with. And the other thing I do religiously, if you will, is I work with people inside the tradition always. And I always like, for example, Richard Schwartz. Uh, in Judaism. I'll always have him look at my documents. Matthew Haltman is, uh, um, and uh, Steve Kaufman will always look at whatever I do in Christianity. Having people who are vegans, who are inside these specific traditions, and, and if they tell me something doesn't work for them, then it doesn't work. And especially if more than one person tells me that. And it almost never happens. It, almost always, uh, they will come back and say, you know, you got it. So it is working for me to just immerse myself in the texts, but having that double check of people inside the traditions is critical for me. And in that way, I prevent um, imposing myself into these other traditions, I believe, or at least as well as I can. And I'm getting that affirmation back from people inside the traditions. Aside from the religions, I know you've spent uh, a lot of time establishing different ways to protect wildlife, working with rural communities and indigenous peoples across the, from Asia to the Americas over many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, how do you fashion your work or how do you envision the ways that you can support those situations of social injustice, man's inhumanity to man, not just to animals, mm -hmm. really in terms of that kind of oppression, whether it's trafficking, whether it's whatever it may be, is mm -hmm. tapestry involved in trying to look at some of those issues and addressing some of those too? Or is it kind of focused on just what you just said before? Tapestry is is surrounds around my energy and my work. I I am the one who does all the work, and mostly what I offer is anytime anyone wants me to address a classroom, a group, or talk to them, I'm always there to mentor. If someone were to invite me to help with something like that, I would be happy to do it. Okay. One of the main ways that I work with Indigenous people all the time, and is I will always get a consult with them before I do anything. Uh, but more often and most often what I do is uh, when I'm talking, for example, about fish, which are neglected in our movement and in the vegan movement in general, when I'm focusing on fish and how critical it is that we make the choice to stop eating fish, I always say ethics is a choice. If you don't have a choice, it's not ethics. So if you are a person who is completely dependent on throwing your net out there to catch fish, it's a different category and it's not one I'm willing to address. What I am willing to do is say there are indigenous people who are activists and they inside their tradition with their understanding of their tradition are working to help fish and people because you can't just pull the fish out of someone's mouth. Right. You have to make sure that people have something to eat 
and the fish need to be kept in the water. And I will also say I'm always very clear, the problems we have right now with this, the collapse of the seas, it's absolutely caused by, yes, white people. I have to think to be yeah, sure. It's, a, it's people of privilege with industrial fishing complex. It's not little people in a small boat throwing yes. a fishing rod into the sea to put a no, fish on their that's plate. that's right. Because they have and no it is, food. And, and it is now... That. And it's now universal, right? All the all the nations, including the indigenous people, have been doing industrialized fishing now for a hundred years, and they are culpable as well. But I am talking to my people. I am talking to people who generally look like me because there's so much work to do. Why would I be fishing around to try to, you know? Why would I be doing that? There, there's a lot of work to do right here in my own country and my own culture. Right. And then aside from that, supporting others who are doing the work elsewhere. Well, Lisa, as we kind of wind things down to some degree, what 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 words or message would you like to share and impart with the people that are out here? First, I want to say you're wonderful to talk to. You're very articulate. And you're very informed, and I really appreciate that. Well, it's thank wonderful. you, Lisa. I appreciate that. Uh, these are so these are, these issues are just as important to me as they are to you. So yes, when I find course. someone like you, that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to meet you. I was just really excited about the fact that you have really taken the time and have really put the time in with your life to really empirically address these things, not just sit in some ivory tower. You've been out with people, with the world. And that's important. I think we need to see that and be there with that. It's very, very important. But I I thank you for that, though. Mm, Well, thank you. Uh, You know, what I'd say is that we all have our place and our part. And, And I always, you know, you've really helped in this interview, really for the first time. I have focused on the disabilities that have gotten me to where I am. And so we each have something to offer, some gift. And I had privilege on top of that that allowed me to really do something, you know, despite the fact that I have a reading disability, I'm hyperactive and it's hard to get me to sit very long. And and luckily was born at a time before drugs so that now my energy is wonderful as I get older and the benefits of aging and the knowledge accumulated and the ability to do something with that. So I would just say, all of us have our gifts, all of us have our place, and whatever work we're doing, we're working together, and that's what Tapestry is about, and if I can ever be of use to you, if I can ever help any of you in anything you're doing, please get in touch with me. My email is on at lisakemmer.com. You can find my email, and also at Tapestry, which is, I think, called Tapestry of Peace. It's also vegan tapestry. And I would extend that same thing to you. If there's any way you ever feel that any of us or me or anybody can help what you're doing, I'm more than willing to be on board with that and use my platforms and my information and my experience Mm -hmm. to help that in any way. Because the truth is, the word is, the words are, you know, collaboration and support. The fact of the matter is there is no separation between any of us. That's an illusion that has only really Mm -hmm. created all kinds of devastation in the world. And I mean, there's no separation between any of us and certainly any other species and the earth Mm -hmm. itself. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, that's almost a very old Native American concept, this web of life Mm -hmm. where we're a strand of the web. We're not, you know, we don't, we don't own the web. We're part of it. You know what I mean? So, and we have to get past that privilege and that abuse that has created this idea of separation and disconnection. Because yes. it's only through collaboration and connection that we're going to change some of that's this right. devastation that's going on around us. And, that's and, right. And I'm hopeful, and I know you are too, but, you know, I always get concerned with the inhumanity that we do to each other. It's really interesting to get an idea. What are we going to need to do for people to become more humane to creatures that are not even our own species when we're so brutal to our own species itself? So there's a lot of work to do in consciousness to yes. really kind of expand the way we look at each other, other creatures, mm-hmm. the planet and the world. And we we don't have a lot of time to waste to do it because we've created some issues that are really quite devastating. And, yes. we, and we need to act now. And, yes. And yes. I'm with you and, and I'm with you on that. And I'm so glad you added to the idea of interconnections, the importance of hope. I was listening to NPR and, and they were saying, somebody was saying in an interview uh, that's working with her kids. And she just said, one thing I owe my kids is hope. However desperate I feel about life, I owe them hope. And I would say that as activists, we owe the world hope. That however however much we know about how bad things are, we have to be hopeful. We have to give, we have to provide ways of bringing change and pulling together. Because if we don't, we've defeated our own purpose. Right. Absolutely. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for the time that you've shared with us, your insight, your information, your heart, your compassion, which is beautiful. And I urge our listeners to really follow you, go online to the site that you can see in the show notes, 
a follow up with Lisa, take your role in being activists within your own lives and worlds. We all can do that. That's very important. We can act locally in very powerful ways within our lives. And I urge you to do that. And I really want to thank the people that have joined us today. Without you, we couldn't do what we do. That's right. And I want to thank you for being part of this very active, healthy community. And on behalf of the National Health Association, I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. And I thank you for being with us today. And I look forward to being with you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant-exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.